Hello my motor enthusiasts, strap in as we journey through the thrilling twists and turns of the 2023 International Formula 4 season. Spanning from Italy to India, we witness some of the most exciting races and promising talents this sport has to offer. From Kachper Stuka's champion form in the Italian F4 to Rikuto Kobayashi's dominance in the Japanese championships. On the other side of the world, in Mexico, Pedro Juan Moreno secured the NACAM F4 championship, while Theophile Nail outshone competition in Spain. Evan Gilter's triumph in the French and Middle Eastern championships, and Vinicius Tassaro's commanding performance in Brazil, were the headlines in their regions. And let's not forget the thrilling conclusion in the F4 Southeast Asia and the Central European zone. What a season it's been, wouldn't you agree? Switching gears for a moment, I'm your guide to the thrilling world of motorsport, Enzo, coming to you daily on the F1 Motor Fever podcast. Always by my side is my trusty co-pilot, Mr. William, a man with an encyclopedia of Formula One knowledge in his head. Hey, I'd say a small library at least, Enzo. Humble, as always, Mr. William. Now I'm sure our listeners are eager to hear more about this news, so remember folks, to keep up with the fast-paced world of Formula One, make sure you're subscribed and have your notifications turned on. And don't forget to leave us a comment and share our podcast with your friends and family. It really helps to keep our engines running here at F1 Motor Fever Podcast. Absolutely, William Turner. And trust me, you won't believe what we've got in store for you today. Full throttle. So let's delve into these championships a bit more, shall we? First off, Italy was a hotbed for F4 action, celebrating its 10th season. Alongside organizer ACI Sport launched Euro 4, sort of a sister series running parallel with the Italian F4 championship. Interesting. Could you expand on the concept of a sister series? Certainly. A sister series in this context is a spin-off championship that runs alongside the main one, sharing some aspects, like the type of cars or the regulations, but also having its unique features. For example, Euro 4 visited Italy twice and Spain once for its three-round season. However, it could be argued that its existence was somewhat superfluous, considering Italian F4 had two international rounds itself. So who were the stars of these championships? Well, let's start with Prema, a powerhouse in the Italian F4 championship. Five of their drivers were victorious, but the title was snatched by U.S. Racing's Kachper Stuka. He started strong winning the season opener, but then didn't win again until race 14. From then on, he notched up an impressive streak of six consecutive victories. Quick side note, how many drivers do these races usually have? The grids can vary, but in the Italian F4, for example, there was an average of 33 starters per race. Quite a crowd, wouldn't you say? Indeed, and do all these drivers have a shot at winning? That's a good question. While the grid was large, only six of the 50 drivers that participated actually won races, with another six reaching the podium. Despite the large pool, the winner's circle remained pretty exclusive. Fascinating. What about the Euro 4 spin-off? A week after losing the Italian title, Ugo Ugo Chukwu, the runner-up in Italian F4, went to Barcelona for Euro 4. The championship was decided in the final race in a thrilling four-way contest. Ugo Chukwu managed a victory, but it wasn't enough to clinch the title. Goes to show how competitive and unpredictable these races can be. Now let's shift our gears from Europe to Asia, specifically Japan. With a surprisingly short season of only 14 races spread over six months, Japanese F4 still sees some intense action. The junior drivers of Honda and Toyota frequently battle it out for the top spots, with Toyota taking a dominant eight victories against Honda's five. Quite a rivalry they've got going on there. Indeed, it's almost as intense as our rivalry with the F1 Motor Fever podcast, Curling Podcast. Wait, what? We have a rivalry with a curling podcast? Hey, hey. just pulling your leg, mate. Now back to the real racing action. The Japanese F4 season was dominated by Toyota Jr. Rikuto Kobayashi. He started the season on a high with a lights-to-flag win at Fuji Speedway, but he had to fight tooth and nail for his victories at later rounds. Blimey, you had me there. 
but this Kobayashi surely seems to be a rising star. Absolutely. However, the championship was not a walk in the park for him. Honda Jr. Yusuke Mitsui won both races from pole in round two at Suzuka, making the championship quite dynamic. In fact, at one point, Kobayashi slipped to third in the standings. Wow, that's the kind of roller coaster ride that keeps us all hooked. Couldn't agree more. With only four races remaining, six drivers were still in the running for the championship. But in true dramatic fashion, the Toyota Juniors, including Kobayashi, hit top form and he regained his position at the top of the table. Now that's what I call racing. Moving away from the land of the rising sun, let's talk about Chinese F4, which is a bit different as it still uses first-generation F4 cars from Miguel. The grid sizes average 16 cars, despite there only being six full-time entries. Only six full-time entries? That's interesting. Yes, it certainly makes for a very dynamic grid. Now the title fight here was between Tiago Rodriguez and Kaishin Liu. Liu was the star of the first round at Zhuhai. He took two poles, two wins, a second and a third from the weekend's four races. That's quite a performance. Indeed. However, Liu was absent from round two at Ningbo due to a clash with his Italian F4 program. This allowed Rodriguez to step up, claiming three victories. The championship was indeed neck to neck with the lead swinging back and forth. Sounds like a riveting contest. Absolutely. But the real drama unfolded in the final round. Rodriguez was leading Liu in race one until the last lap when Liu attempted a pass. Unfortunately, they both ended up off the track, gifting victory to the debuting Yingjie Xu. Rodriguez did bounce back to win races two and four, extending his championship lead. One thing is clear, there's never a dull moment in these championships. Couldn't agree more. It just shows how competitive and thrilling Formula 4 can be. Now let's jump over to the Mexico for the NACAM F4 Championship. Pedro Juan Moreno monopolized the season with an impressive run of eight consecutive victories. Eight wins in a row? That's quite some streak. Indeed, his winning streak catapulted him to the top of the standings, outpacing Christian Cantu. But it wasn't all smooth sailing. At one point, Cantu led Moreno by a significant eight seconds at Carataro, only to throw away the victory by heading to the pits. Oh, that's a costly error. Absolutely. This allowed Moreno to win by a margin of 10.2 seconds. Later, Cantu came back strong, winning five of the season's last six races. But Moreno had already built up a significant lead, allowing him to skip the doubleheader season finale as the title was already in his pocket. So, a bit of drama in the end, but Moreno still came out on top. Fascinating. Indeed. Moving on to Spain, we have Theophile Nail who did an exceptional job securing eight wins, six other podiums and five poles. As a result, he clinched the title with two races to spare, showing his dominance in the Spanish F4 circuit. That's great racing, no matter where you are. Formula 4 really does have some exciting talent on show. Staying in Spain a bit longer, we saw an impressive late charge by Christian Ho from Campos Racing, who won the last four races of the season. Nothing like a strong finish to the season. Absolutely. Although it didn't make the title fight any closer, it sure made the races more exciting. We also saw some notable performances by MP Motorsports' Valerio Rinicella, who was always in the mix, taking the checkered flag in all 21 races. That's what you call consistency. True, and Spanish F4's top rookie, Enzo Deligny, deserves a mention finishing fourth in the standings with notable consistency over the season's 21 races. Quite the showing for a rookie. Indeed. And now, let's journey out of Europe to the F4 United Arab Emirates Championship. The top spots here were dominated by Prema Run cars, who won 13 of the 15 races. The season kicked off with Ugo Chukwu winning the first two races, but the spotlight soon shifted to the Ferrari Juniors, Tuka Tapanen and Wharton. Sounds like Ferrari has quite the promising lineup coming up. Yes, and Wharton in particular stood out, making history by winning the first ever single-seater race in Kuwait. Despite Tapanen's triple win at Dubai Autodrome, Wharton maintained his points lead and secured the championship title in the final round at Yas Marina Circuit. Well, that's an impressive season. Looking forward to seeing what these drivers do next. Still on the topic of the F4 United Arab Emirates Championship, it was quite a dramatic final race. 
Tapanen, the only one who could have denied Wharton the title, started in third position. Sounds like the making of a thriller. Indeed, it was. Taponen tried to outmaneuver Wharton at the opening corner, but they both ended up running off track and collided. The impact broke Wharton's suspension, ending his race there and then. Oh, that's a shocking turn of events. Absolutely. Taponen managed to return to the pits, but had to retire as well, which meant Wharton had clinched the championship regardless. Uga Chukwu ended up taking his fifth win of the season. What a roller coaster. Moving on to South America, Brazilian F4's second season saw Vinicius Tessaro winning the title with a race to spare, despite only claiming three pole positions over the course of the campaign. His chief rival was Matheus Comparado, who also claimed three poles along with four victories. A tight competition there. It sure was. Now this may surprise you, but there was an attempt to launch Indian F4 back in August 2021, with Prema running all the cars. But the launch got pushed back by nine months, and then the entire season was cancelled just a fortnight before its new start date in November. Really, that's quite unexpected. Yes, it was quite a roller coaster for them. They now plan to swap their second generation Tatuas chassis for MyGales and start racing in October, with MP Motorsport running the field of cars instead of Prima. They are also planning a night race as part of their first event in December on a new street circuit in Chennai. Interesting. A night race could certainly add a different dynamic to the races. Continuing our discussion on the Indian F4, the inaugural event took place on November 4th and 5th, with Cooper Webster winning two of the three races. However, the season was marked by constant changes to the calendar and locations. Several rounds were relocated at short notice, and there were last-minute date changes as well. That sounds quite unpredictable. Can you give an example of these changes? Of course. For instance, the season opener, which was originally set to be held on Hyderabad's Formula E circuit, got relocated to Chennai's permanent circuit just a few days before the event. Later, Chennai was also set to host back-to-back -back rounds at the end of November and beginning of December. But this was changed, with round two set for December 1st and 2nd, and round three postponed to December 5th and 6th. Sounds like a logistical nightmare. Most definitely, and the chaos did not stop there. Weather disruptions played havoc with the schedule too. The second round of the season was shortened due to bad weather, and then Cyclone Mekong caused further disruption, forcing the cancellation of round three and relocation of round four. And how did this affect the season overall? Well, to make up for the disruptions, Indian F4 held five races in quick succession on the short layout of the Chennai track. Cooper Webster shone through these changes, winning three of those races, and ultimately clinched the title with two more wins in the final round. He must have been quite flexible to adapt to all those changes. Yes, indeed. Speaking of championships, let's shift our attention to French F4. It was Evan Gilter who stood out, winning the title in a dramatic finale. The difference between him and the runner-up, Enzo Peugeot, was a mere four points. That sounds like a nail-biter. Yes, it was quite a close battle, with Gilter standing on the podium 13 times, same as Peugeot. However, Peugeot had a slight edge in terms of victories, with seven wins to Gilter's six. And how did the rest of the field fare? The third place went to Kevin Foster, who was a considerable 101 points behind the top two. He stood out at Nogaro, claiming his sole victory there. Just a quick side note here, I've been pulling a lot of this information from an article I came across on the Formula Scout site. It's a comprehensive review of the 2023 International Formula 4 season, penned by Ida Wood. Ah, Formula Scout, yes. They do a commendable job of covering all tiers of motorsport, don't they? It's always good to get our facts from reliable sources. Absolutely, couldn't agree more. It's crucial to ensure the information we share is accurate and from trustworthy sources. Now, let's get back to our discussion. Moving forward in our review, it was the reverse grid races that played a significant part in the French F4 title fight. Drivers like Garrett Barry and Yanni Stevenhuydens, who weren't necessarily frontrunners, managed to bag big results in these races. 
both finishing sixth and contributing to the overall excitement of the season. Reversed grid races always add an extra dynamic, don't they? Absolutely. And speaking of dynamics, let's dive into the dramatic final round at Paul Ricard. Gilter and Peugeot went in with a point difference of 28. Gilter had the upper hand, taking both pole positions while Peugeot was only fifth fastest. In the first race, Gilter converted his pole into victory, reducing Peugeot's lead. Sounds like a tense situation. Indeed it was. An unfortunate contact in the reverse grid race ended Peugeot's chance early on. Gilter managed to finish fourth, which meant he went into the title decider four points behind Peugeot. If he turned pole into victory, the championship would be his. And that's exactly what he did. And Peugeot? He had a desperate time indeed. Trying to make his way up the order, he ended Kevin Foster's race in a clash. And even though he managed to pass Hiyu Yamakoshi for second, he was already 3.8 seconds behind Gilter. Now let's shift focus to Australia, where F4 racing has been continuing in the form of the Australian Formula Open. This series, which features a mix of Formula 3, Toyota Racing Series, and first-generation F4 cars, saw Christian Janev clinch the AF04 title. It was quite a close battle, though, with Brody Norris finishing just three points behind Janev, albeit with eight wins from his 11 starts. Sounds like a captivating season, both in France and Australia. Let's head over to the United States now. There, Patrick Woods Toth claimed victory in the United States F4 Championship, which saw a grand total of eight different race winners in the year 2023. Quite a diverse field of winners then. Indeed, it adds to the thrill. But the United States also houses several other national and regional F4 series. One of them is Formula Development, which is set to rebrand as the Ligier JS F4 series next year, continuing to use first-generation cars. Now here's an inspiring story. Dmitry Pistoliako, who spent over a decade running an online English language school, finally lived his childhood dream this year by not only becoming a racing driver, but also a title-winning one. He started the F4 Western season with a string of five victories and then secured four second places, eventually clinching the championship by 84 points. That's quite an achievement. Absolutely. Moving on to Scandinavia, the Danish F4 title saw a bit of a family affair. Mikkel and Magnus Petersen were the main contenders, with them winning 11 out of the season's 18 races. Despite a strong challenge from Theodore Jensen, who won four times but only competed in seven races, it was Matthias Bjerre Jakobsen who emerged as the best of the rest driver, taking two wins and finishing third in the standings. Sounds like a fiercely competitive season. It was. But an interesting note to end on, the Formula Renault 1.6 spec Formula Nordic was also incorporated into Danish F4 this year. Linus Grandforce, in an impressive feat, managed to beat the F4 stars to win a race overall. And next year, they will merge into one series, the Nordic 4. As we continue to explore, we see a similar pattern of grit and competition across the globe. In Finland, Nestori Vertala raced against F3 cars at Formula Open Finland rounds, truly showcasing the spirit of the sport. Moving on to Asia, after a three-year hiatus, F4 Southeast Asia made a comeback with a visit to China. What are your thoughts so far on the global scope of F4 racing? It truly is remarkable. F4 racing is a testament to the universal appeal of motorsport. From the United States to Europe, Australia to Asia, these young drivers are not only showcasing their talent, but also the passion that resonates across cultures and continents. The future of the sport looks bright with such diverse and promising talent coming up through the ranks. Well said. The enthusiasm and commitment of these young racers are indeed infectious. Taking a look at Southeast Asia again, we had an impressive 18-car entry list at Sepang, which included sports car star Dorian Pin and karting graduates Kian Nakamura Berta and Tomas Stolchermanis. Despite their efforts, it was Hadrian David who dominated with three wins. Indeed, it's always exciting to see fresh faces on the grid, isn't it? Absolutely. It's also worth mentioning that the ACCR F4 evolved into F4 Central European Zone for 2023, with an average grid size of less than eight cars. 
The title bout was quite a nail-biter with Ethan Isher beating his Genzer Motorsport teammate Reno Franco by just two points. As we observe these developments, it becomes clear that the spirit of competitive racing is alive and well across the globe, wouldn't you say? Absolutely. The world of F4 racing is burgeoning with potential, and it's a pleasure to witness these young racers carving their paths in the sport. For those who've just tuned in, we've been traveling the world, in a manner of speaking, discussing the various F4 series. We've talked about the United States F4 Championship, the Danish F4 title, as well as F4 Southeast Asia. We also touched upon the ambitious efforts of Nestori Vertala in Finland, racing against F3 cars. We then moved on to the return of F4 Southeast Asia after three years, with a host of newcomers making their mark. And we just finished talking about the nail-biting finale of the F4 Central European Zone Championship. So what are your impressions so far? It's been quite a journey, hasn't it? Just shows the sheer variety and depth of talent in F4 racing. Truly outstanding. Absolutely, it's a testament to the universal appeal of motorsport. Now let's delve back in as we continue our journey through the world of F4 racing. Moving on, let's delve into the nail-biting finale of F4 Central European Zone, where Franco was relegated to third by a five-second penalty, and the title went to Isher. Now picture this, it's the penultimate lap, Sauter dives inside Franco into turn one. Franco fights back, they touch, and Sauter is forced into the gravel. Oh, that was quite a turn of events, wasn't it? A real-life thriller on the racetrack. Absolutely. Now onto the newly launched all-female F1 Academy series, which was dominated by Prima. But here's a fun fact. Did you know that Marta Garcia, the champion, had only come ninth in Spanish F4 back in 2017? Ha ha ha! Talk about a massive leap forward. Right? Goes to show that anything can happen in motorsport. One moment you're ninth, and the next, you're the champion! Ha! It really is a testament to the unpredictability and excitement of this sport. A true roller coaster ride. And speaking of roller coasters, let's not forget the Alcabisi sisters. Hamda took victories at three different tracks to secure herself third in the standings, while her sister Amna had two reversed grid race wins. What's even more impressive is that they proved their medal away from their home circuits in the UAE. That's the beauty of F4, isn't it? It's always churning out these incredible stories. But, I have to say, it's a bit like having a surprise party every weekend. You never know what's going to happen next. Ha ha ha. Ha ha ha, indeed. Now let's have a look at the 2023's F4 stars. Now if we dive into the numbers, we can see some interesting trends. Take Zachary David, for instance. 47 races under his belt and 10 wins from Lindblad. That's quite impressive, isn't it? Indeed it is. And speaking of impressive, we can't overlook Ruichi Liu. 46 races participated in and a commendable performance by Wharton with 8 wins. And there's Ugo Ugo Chukwu. 45 races with Christian Ho achieving 7 wins. The competition is indeed fierce. Oh, absolutely. It's neck and neck out there. Then we have James Wharton and Ethan Isher with 45 races each and Isher clinching 8 wins. It's interesting to see how different drivers fare. Some are constant, while for others, the tides can turn quickly. Couldn't have put it better myself. Let's not forget Tuka Tapan and Nico Lacorte, each with 45 races, and Marta Garcia impressively tallying seven wins. The sheer talent in F4 is mind-boggling. It's a real testament to the future of motorsport. It's remarkable to see these drivers progress and grow. Absolutely. And let's not forget William McIntyre and James Pissick also with 45 races each, and Enzo Peugeot clocking seven wins. It's a fast-paced world out there. These statistics really put into perspective the grueling nature of F4 racing. That's right. These figures reveal the raw, unfiltered reality of motorsports, where every second counts, and every race could be a game-changer. But it's not the end of the road just yet. William, let's see what's brewing on the internet today. Any interesting comments? Ah, I've got one right here. Slowly the user has posted, quote, Perez told Red Bull F1 seat in 2025 is his to lose, unquote. Interesting. Tell me more about the responses. Takis12 commented, quote, It all depends on how much Dr. Marco's experiments of cloning Max are successful, unquote. 
Cold Pentecost replied, quote, I know you're joking, but can two Maxes really work as a team? Especially with how competitive he was is, unquote. That's a good point. What else is being said? Maze Magic chimed in saying, quote, I'm actually shocked he even made it to 2025. Either they didn't want to pay him off, or Ricciardo having an injury was a setback on him preparing and getting back into it, unquote. Hmm, intriguing. Any other noteworthy comments? Indeed, there's an interesting thread from Wedgeend, who said, quote, I think they need Danny as the face of the AT rebranding for 2024. He's very marketable and brings extra coverage for the new team identity, similar to Schumacher in Mercedes or Vettel in Aston Martin. With Checo, they are not in a hurry to replace him as long as Max can win the WCC alone, unquote. Those are some well-articulated points. Any other significant remarks? Yes, there's a good back and forth about Yuki Tsunoda. Bionic Bear doubted Yuki's potential for growth, while Pluck Pubes defended him. Curious Pumpkino chimed in on how Yuki's situation is unique, before Expensive Method 8321 argued that Yuki's retention is due to his solid performance and the team's needs. It seems like there's quite a varied mix of opinions out there. Any final comments? Well, there's an interesting thread about Perez's popularity. Some users pointed out that Perez is very popular in Mexico and other Hispanic markets, and they speculated about how much revenue he might bring in. Others debated whether Yuki Tsunoda has only maintained his seat because of Honda's influence. Diverse views as always. That's part of the charm of motorsports, isn't it? Everyone has an opinion, and they're all worth considering. What an exhilarating episode. We delved into the intricacies of team strategies, driver performances, and even peeked into the world of online chatter. Thanks to all of you for joining us today on F1 Motor Fever Podcast. Your support keeps us going. If you've enjoyed the ride, don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification bell. You won't want to miss any of our episodes. Tell your friends, share our channel, and let's discuss the fast-paced world of Formula One together. And remember, we love your comments, so keep them coming. And don't forget we're here every day. More banter, more analysis, and more good old-fashioned chinwag about all things Formula One. Let's keep the conversation going, folks. Also, keep your eyes peeled for some exciting stuff coming up on the horizon. Who knows what the next race will bring? We're so grateful for your support. We can't wait to bring you more electrifying discussions and insightful analysis in our upcoming episodes. Until then, as we always say, William and Enzo, pedal to the metal, keep your gaze on the road. Our channel's content is pure gold.